Hello, YouTubes. Welcome back. We have uh, an extra special recording of a uh, English 375 lecture for you today. Extra special it is because it's the last one. <gasps> We're done after this. We made it, class. Uh, this will be the last recorded YouTube video. We have one more class after this, which is um, a synchronous class through Microsoft Teams that will be on Thursday, May the 14th. Thursday, May the 14th, rather than Friday, May the 15th. Um, due to academic scheduling, we're trying to maintain that as best we can. Thursday um, is Friday classes, so we're going to do our normal Friday synchronous class then, and that's going to be it for the semester. That's the last you'll ever, no, it's not the last you'll ever be seeing of me. Hopefully I'll see you around after that. Don't be a stranger, but maintain your social distancing at least a little while longer. So uh, today we're going to wrap up some things. I have a, uh, I can show you today's topics, you know, got to make use of the whiteboard on our last day. So we have some stuff to cover from essentially from Monday's lecture that we didn't quite get to. We were looking at these odd predicate types, different types of um, embedded um, non-finite clauses. And now we're going to continue that. We're going to be looking at our last type that we didn't quite make it to. This is the subject to object raising type of sentences. And then in the second half of the lecture, I just have a few notes um, of things that I want to remind you of leading up to the exam. A little like mini crash review session with me where I bring up some points for you to focus, not to focus on, but some, some trouble spots that I've seen students both in this semester and in semesters past struggling with. And so I want to bring those up, raise those, draw those to your attention so that you can you can focus on them a little bit. Um, and that should leave extra time on Thursday's synchronous class for us, for me to take your questions, which is really what I aim to be doing in Thursday's synchronous class. So please do come to that session with questions as well. That will make that the, the most productive use of both of our times. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit more about raising and control. Raising versus control. So um, <clears throat> we're going to know a very interesting dichotomy in sentences right now um, in this first half of today's class between something like Janice wants to leave and Janice wants Ross to leave. Janice wants to leave, Janice wants Ross to leave. They look very similar on the surface, actually, right? It's just one word different. Whether uh, It's just one word different. But this one word is actually going to shift our structure considerably. And it's going to change it from a control sentence, a subject control sentence, to a raising sentence, uh, an object, subject to object raising question. So first, let's take a quick review down a uh, memory lane here to remember what a subject um, control sentence even looks like. Let's take Janice wants to leave as our example. And we're going to be taking first again, when we, whenever we're dealing with these kind of tricky predicates with weird things and kind of a mismatch between not enough subjects and theta rules, etc. We want to start by making our theta grids. It's going to be our fallback plan for these odd predicates. And so I've done that here. This is very similar to what we looked at before. So here's the theta grid for to leave. Leave just takes an agent like I left. Awesome. Awesome. And want takes an agent. Somebody is doing the wanting and it takes a propositional CP. Um, they want something. Ross to leave, for instance, right? Oh, somebody wants something and they, somebody is doing the wanting and there's the thing that is wanted. So it only takes two theta rolls there. The interesting part with this first sentence we note is that there's only two things. <laughs> there's only two arguments here. So we know from the theta grids here that there are three theta rolls to be assigned, but there are only two arguments. It can be kind of hard to see the two arguments. Janus is an obvious one. Janus is a really obvious um, argument in this structure. But there's another one, which is the proposition. And these propositions, uh, this isn't my review section, but it could be. These propositions are really hard to spot for their theta rules. So this to leave is a proposition. proposition. So if we were filling out this theta rule, this theta grid, excuse me, with all the different theta rules and the arguments that they are assigned to, we would go like this. Who is doing the wanting? Who is doing the wanting? Janice. Janice is pretty clearly 
doing the wanting. You know, what does Janice want? So I'm going to put a J here. I'll, I'll try and mark this so it's a little, ooh, that's a terrible, terribly handwritten J. Kind of like a fish hook, although I guess that is kind of what um, J's look like. Anyway, uh, what does Janice want? Well, she wants this proposition and to leave, somebody to leave, something going on with leaving. So the proposition is the sort of X to leave there. And to denote this proposition, I'm going to take this weird notational turn that we kind of innovated during the last class and put these little brackets. It's that whole thing, right? It's the whole to leave. Oh, I just smudged everything. How confident are you that I can draw a straight line while not looking? Uh, uh, hopefully you weren't very confident. Um, this whole proposition. And then, so we have these two, that's fine. But the, the, the tricky bit comes when we ask ourselves, what's, who's leaving? What's the, what's the argument that is being assigned the agent theta role from leave? Whoa, that's weird, right? We don't have anything left, essentially. But nonetheless, we can semantically ask ourselves this question. Who is leaving here? And we find that, oddly enough, semantically in this sentence, what's going on here is that Janice wants that Janice leaves. Janice wants to leave herself. She doesn't like want to leave herself alone, but she wants to be the one that's leaving. Janice wants to be the one that's leaving. So Janice is both the agent, getting an agent theta role from wants, and it also seems to be the agent of leaving. Can we do that? Mm -mm. No, 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 we cannot do that, right? That violates the theta criterion. Each argument has to get one theta rule, and each theta rule has to be assigned to only one argument. Therefore, if Janice is receiving an agent rule, agent theta rule from both to leave and from wants, we have a failure. So instead, we solved this by saying, ah, mm -hmm, there must be a, an additional agent here. There must be an additional agent which is absorbing this theta rule from leave and it must be co-indexed with Janus because we know that semantically it's Janus. And so what we did is we made up, okay, we didn't make this up. People in the past, blame syntacticians if you want a target, have come up with this thing called big pro. Big pro. It's got a fantastic name at least, big pro. And big pro is a pronoun that's co-indexed with Janus here. So we get the, the, the correct semantic reading that Janice wants for herself to leave. Um, but it doesn't, it saves our theta grid because it counts as an argument. Therefore, we have a one-to-one -one matching, one-to-one, 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 between all our arguments and our um, theta rules. Sweet. And the other cool part that pro does for us, now that we're, now we can go over to trees, is we see that Janice is here and Here's our present tense wants and to leave. And we were kind of missing something in the subject position here where I have a DP triangle, but nothing there. Oh, that's where the subject should go for leave that's getting this agent theta role. Well, we couldn't put Janice here for multiple reasons. Um, the main one being it wouldn't receive case. It would not receive case because this is a non-finite clause. So there's no nominative case assigned here. Luckily, pro comes in to save the day and fits exactly in that place structurally. P-R-O, P-R-O, it's like a good chant, big pro. <clears throat> big pro, coming in to save the day. So now that we see pro is now in a nice position to get its agent theta role from leave, it's in the same clause, which is really nice. And this weird part about pro is that it doesn't need case, does not need case. Lucky for it, can't receive case there anyway, so it's a perfect match. It's almost as if pro, big pro, was custom designed to fit into this slot. It's almost like that uh, because it's actually like that. Custom, right? it, it actually was made to fit in exactly that slot. So we're not really surprised that, of, of, that its characteristics match our situation. We, we, we made them do so, but it nonetheless does make it handy. So there's that. Uh, so that's, that's a, a, a control sentence that involves these big big pro. And you can spot a control sentence essentially when you have um, not enough arguments to take all the theta roles, typically. That's a good sign in our class, at least, that you've got a control sentence going on, right? We For this sentence um, over here, Janice wants to leave, we saw that there were three theta roles to be assigned, but there were only two arguments. 
And there we, we, we have a good idea that we might want a big pro. This in particular is called subject control, subject big control, because the subject is the one controlling or co-indexed with the big pro, not an object. Object control, if you want to look at object control, we looked at that at the end of class last time. I'm not going to re-talk about that uh, here, otherwise I would basically just be giving the same lecture as, as last class. <laughs> But now, if you uh, feel clarified on the subject of control, let's see what I did there with subject, but um, you can go back and watch it and hopefully it will make more sense. That's subject control. The subject is controlling the big pro. Okay, now with that review in mind and kind of the structural idea, now, we, now that I've got you in the right frame of mind, let's take a look at this next sentence, which is weird. <coughs> One, uh, a member in my class who, who shall not be named um, asked me about this question a couple weeks ago and I was like, oh, these are weird sentence types. I, was, I got stumped, but I'm back for more here. I, I rallied. And so now we're going to be talking about subject to object raising. Uh, in a sentence type like Janice wants Ross to leave. Janice wants Ross to leave. So it looks like, can I actually set this here? I can actually set it on my desk. Spare myself. Oh, I'm a little close. Janice wants Ross to leave. It looks like in this sentence that all that we're doing, right, is we're replacing Janice is still the one doing the wanting. Somebody to leave is still the proposition. This part's all right. But who is doing the leaving now? It's not Janice anymore, right? Janice doesn't want, no longer wants for Janice to leave. She specifically wants me, Ross, to leave. And so what it looks like is happening is that Ross is taking the place of this pro. And in some ways that's true. Ross is taking this agent theta role from leave. Ross is the one who's leaving. So we're gonna put, I'm gonna put a big R there to signify myself. X marks the spot signature style. A big R, bam. So that's different, right? That's a change from sentence one to sentence two, but What's the problem here? So we're not, we're not out of the woods. We can't do a simple substitution and think that that's gonna solve our issues. It, it doesn't. It, it solves the theta criterion issue very nicely in exactly the same way that Big Pro did. But what special properties did Big Pro have again? If you want some time to think before I just um, blurt out the answer to this dilemma, feel free to pause me as always. What special properties did Big Pro have? Well, it was silent, that was one thing. Ross isn't silent, hardly ever. Um, but the other property was that it doesn't need case. So it worked in this particular environment as the subject in spec TP of a non-finite clause to leave, to leave can't assign case, pro doesn't need case, so they were a match made in heaven. But when you replace pro with Ross, like we just did, I'll, I'll, I'll switch that in the tree. It doesn't work out as well. This is a match made somewhere else. Um, I, Ross, as a, a normal R expression DP, needs to receive case, and it isn't getting it from to leave because to leave is non-finite and can't assign nominative case there. So this should be a failure. This should be ungrammatical. It should pass the theta criterion, right? We know actually that Ross is in fact generated here in spec TP because of its theta role position, but it can't end up there. And it can't end up there because otherwise it would be a case filter violation. Ross is a case filter violation as we currently have it. It's not receiving case from anywhere. So how do we solve this? Well, take a look at what this phenomenon is called. <laughs> this is called subject to object raising. That gives you your first clue as to how we're gonna be solving this weird problem of Janice wants Ross to leave. What we're gonna say is that Ross, looking for case, looks up further in the tree and tries to find um, a case, a nearby case position. I'm going to change a few things in the tree now. I got to finagle. I got to do some uh, special tactics here on my tree drawing to get us into the right positions. One moment. 
Hmm. I didn't draw this tree very well, but uh, we're, we're 15 minutes into the lecture, so it's just going to have to cut it. So Ross is looking desperately for case. Resume to this scenario in which Ross is looking desperately for case. And where does it find it? Well, it finds it as the complement of this higher clause verb wants. It finds it essentially as the object of this higher clause verb wants, as sister to the V head, a position in which accusative case is assigned. A position in which accusative case is assigned. So I'm going to show you what that movement looks like, and then I'm going to give you some evidence that we're on the right track here. I'm going to move Ross up there, and I'm going to replace the lower Ross with a trace. There's not, it's not actually too bad. There was enough room there. I made my, I squeezed myself in there. So now Ross, which was the, which was the subject of this lower clause to leave, a fact that we know because we see it absorb the, um, the theta role there. So we know, remember, theta roles are assigned at deep structure, uh, D structure, essentially. So we know that at D structure, in order to receive this theta role, Ross must be down low. But we also know that Ross needs case. And this is a really nice position for Ross to receive case marking, is the sister of the V head here. Janice wants Ross to leave, where this is now appearing more as a ditransitive sentence, um, kind of like Janice persuaded, Ro persuaded Ross to leave, although there are differences there in that persuaded is uh, actually object control, view the last video, and this one is not. This one is subject, uh, subject to object raising. Nonetheless, this satisfies our, our criteria, the theta criterion is satisfied, like we said, the EPP is satisfied, right? This subject uh, position has a trace in it, and this one has Janus in it. And this also satisfies our case filter. Janus receives case from this finite T up here, and Ross now receives case from um, being the sister to the V head. This is a CP, and it doesn't need case. So we match, we, we check everything off. Um, in a really nice way there. This is called subject to object raising. Subject to object raising. So what was once the subject of the lower clause is now the object of the higher clause. And you can contrast this um, by going back and watching the last lecture, but you can contrast it with things like subject to subject raising, where we took this and it was Ross starting here and Ross ended up all the way up here in a sentence like Ross seems to leave. Ross seems to leave. Ross was the lower subject, and Ross moves up to be the higher subject. That's called subject to subject raising. In this case, it's different. Um, the subject raises up to become the object, subject to object raising. And uh, what's another way that you can um, test this a little bit? It's not a fantastic test, I'll be the first to admit, but it does kind of show us something, is that um, we can see specifically that Ross is indeed receiving accusative case. We know that Ross is receiving accusative case. How can we tell that? Where can we see um, a difference between nominative and accusative case showing up in English? Very, very few places. Basically just pronouns, right? So you can see I, me, he, him, she, her, they, them, um, showing up the differences between nominative and accusative. So if you were going to um, replace Ross with a pronoun, which one would you choose, class? Would you choose a nominatively marked pronoun or would you choose an accusatively marked pronoun? Janice wants he to leave or Janice wants him to leave? Those are your two options where he is nominative and him is accusative. Yeah, Janice wants him to leave. That's what it has to be. Janice wants him to leave. Janice wants him to leave. So we see that this position that Ross is in is A, at D structure, receiving a theta role from the lower one, and B, receiving accusative case. And the only place that, the only pattern that matches both of those facts, 
its theta role and its case is starting here for theta role and moving there for case. So we really don't have any other options, which is nice, I guess, in a strange way. Um, it makes us more confident that we're doing the right thing in these scenarios. So we can contrast this with our other different strange predicate types that we've looked at the past couple of days. I just contrasted subject, this is subject to object raising. I already contrasted that with subject to subject raising, like Ross seems um, to leave. We can also contrast this with um, another thing that it's very close to, which is object control. Object control would be Janice persuaded Ross to leave. Janice persuaded Ross to leave, right? Where all that we do is cross out this wants and add persuaded, and it actually changes the structure. How does that change the structure? Well, it changes the theta grid for the, the word that we changed out. Want and persuade have different theta, theta grids. Um, persuade actually has three, if you'll remember from last lecture, has three theta rules. So in this sentence, back to this subject to object raising one, wants isn't assigning a theta role to Ross. Janice doesn't want Ross. Mm -mm. Janice wants Ross to leave, right? There's no like, you know, she's not like coming on to me or anything. Janice wants Ross, no. Uh, instead, Ross is not receiving a theta role from wants. But in a, sub, in a, in a different setup, in an in a object control scenario, like Janice persuaded Ross to leave, uh, Janice, or Ross is actually being given a theta role from wants. Ross is being given a theta role from persuade. Oh, I keep messing this up. Um, hopefully that makes sense. In subject to object raising, Ross is not receiving a theta role from the higher predicate, but in object control, like Janice persuaded Ross to leave, Ross is receiving a theta role from the higher predicate, persuade. Janice persuaded Ross. What did Janice persuade Ross? Ross to leave. And so there, now that we have three and one, since persuade takes three and leave still only takes one, we run into that con classic control scenario, classic as of this week, <laughs> a classic control scenario in which we have too many theta roles, if we had changed this to persuade, we'd have four total um, theta rules to give and not enough arguments. And again, that's our sign that we're in a control scenario. So that's how subject to object control, subject to object raising differs from subject to subject raising and also differs from object control. Oh, I'm going to stop saying subject, subject, object, control, raising, subject, wants, Ross, Janice, too many words, all the same, and they sound very similar, and they they have these subtle differences, right? So that's the tricky part with these, is a lot of these subjects look so similar. Janice wants to leave and Janice wants Ross to leave look so similar, but they're structurally very different. Janice wants Ross to leave and Janice persuaded Ross to leave look so similar, but they're actually also different structures in terms of control versus raising. Oof. Weird. English wasn't complicated and was was complicated enough before we started to think about it really hard, and then we thought about it, and then it got worse. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, but you signed up for this class, so jokes on you, I guess. That's all I have um, with regards to new content. Check. Check, check, check. That's all the content in this whole class. Subject to object raising is what we ended on. What, what a parade. Um, so I'm gonna erase my board and I have a few final thoughts um, in my, my, my waning minutes of your attention here. And I just wanna talk about very quickly, I don't want to go into depth in any of these issues. If you want to go into more depth on any of the issues that I raised today, that's what Thursday's synchronous class is for. But I want to raise a few issues as my last chance so that I can prime you perhaps a little bit to pay extra attention to the following subjects. Particularly, I'm, I'm talking about your exam exclusively here, Laura. You don't have any homework assignments left. On your exam, pay attention to the following four things. Um, if I'm being very blunt right now, this is essentially four things Ross is worried you're going to mess up. 
prove me wrong, class. Prove me wrong. Uh, don't mess these up and don't mess them up. Uh, not only because I'm going to talk about them right now, but hopefully you've also learned the material well. Um, okay, thing number one that Ross doesn't want you to, to mess up is differentiating between adjuncts and complements. I'm going to write these down. I'm going to make you a list. Can't spell differentiating, so I'm going to make it really sloppy so that um, you can't tell if I spelled it right or not. True honesty coming out in the, the last class. We're, we're, we're feeling feisty today. Differentiating between adjuncts versus complements. I've also been spelling complements uh, basically wrong the entirety of the year. I've been spelling it like I'm complimenting you, like, oh, you guys, um, you did so well on your last homework. Uh, that's actually not how you spell it. <laughs> but you do spell it with an E rather than an I, in case that was um, not clear. Differentiating between adjunct, wait, 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 wait. Yeah, adjuncts and complements. I said that correctly. I thought I was on the wrong um, mental slide, but I wasn't. Differentiating between adjuncts and complements. What is this? Well, hopefully you remember, right? This has to do, it's a structural position. This is determined by differential structural positions. Right? I'm, I'm making an X bar tree at the moment. So this has to do with our x-bar trees and the structural positions. When we have this sort of basic x x-bar structure, an xp with x some number of x-bars and then an x-head, this is the x-head, we find that we have multiple positions that the complement phrase, comp p here is standing for the complement phrase, it's not a real type of phrase, you would uh, substitute this in for something like a determiner phrase, whatever a CP, a DP, um, whatever, um, is the sister to the X head. So structurally, that's what we want you to remember. Complements are the sisters to the X head, whatever the head of the phrase is, where adjuncts are sisters to the X bar. Adjuncts here, this is not an adjective phrase. This, for today's purposes only, is an adjunct phrase, is sister to an X bar. And there's a few consequences of this, if you'll remember very quickly, um, one is that there can only be one complement per phrase because each uh, head can only have one sister, um, where there can be as many adjuncts as you want. So it's a, an important thing to keep in mind as you're drawing these trees where you want to be putting those things. Um, other factors are that complements are typically necessary, especially verbal complements, whereas adjuncts are not necessary and you can add as many as you want. Structurally, how do we figure out which is which? Again, this is, uh, we're not going into any depth here. This is just for your own recall. So you can say like, aha, I do remember that. Um, the complement always appears closest to the X head. The complement is the thing that appears always closest to the X head, closer than adjuncts do. So if you want to tell, is this a complement or is this an adjunct? The easiest way to do that is try to move things around. If I said like, I hit the baseball, I hit the baseball yesterday, right? Already, you know that yesterday isn't a compliment because it's not the closest thing to the verbal head. The baseball is. The baseball's the closest thing. But the closest thing um, isn't good enough because it could still be the closest because it just happens to be a closer adjunct. So what we wanna do is we wanna see if the baseball is necessarily tied in a close relationship to hit or not. I hit the baseball yesterday. Is it just coincidence that the baseball appears next to the verb hit or does it have to be that way? If it's just coincidence, we should be able to switch it. If it has to be that way, it's a compliment. So we try and switch it and we say a sentence like, I hit yesterday the baseball. I hit yesterday the baseball. And we're like, oh, that sounds weird. Right, that's a weird sentence. And that weird sentence is weird because what we found out is that yes, in fact, the baseball is tied to hit. It does have to be the closest thing to hit. Yesterday doesn't, right? So in that scenario, we've deduced 
that the baseball is a complement and that uh, yesterday is an adjunct. Um, and that will determine where we put them on the trees. Remember this. Remember, remember, remember this. When you see adjectives showing up um, or prepositional phrases showing up, um, ask yourself, where should I draw that prepositional phrase? Is that prepositional phrase a complement to either the verb or the noun? Or is that an adjunct? Because I'll mark you down if you put it in the wrong spot. Ooh, not much, but I will mark you down. So that's number one. Number one, we did it. Be careful differentiating complements and adjuncts. Largely, this is a speed issue. Largely, if I asked you, um, is that a complement or an adjunct? I'm confident in your abilities to tell me which one it would be. Um, but oftentimes we just kind of go through the tree so fast and it's clearly not the focus of the tree because Ross is clearly testing us on WH movement in this street, which is probably true, by the way. But nonetheless, I am also checking for complement versus adjunct status. So slow down when you're drawing these trees and really ask yourselves, especially when you see prepositional phrases, but even no matter what your verbal structure is, ask yourself there. And not just verbs, nouns as well, but verbs are kind of the main differentiator there. The main place that's going to come up. Not, not from a theoretical um, standpoint is that differentiated in any way, but from a practical one. Okay, enough about that. I got three more items. Item number two. It has to do with tea. Oh, not this kind of tea, uh, but with the tense phrase. The tense phrase. And I wrote down in my notes, <laughs> what the heck do we do with tea? What the heck goes in tea? That's what we need to know. Tea is weird. Um, the tea head, the, the head of the tense phrase of the tea bean, is very strange for a number of ways. It's strange in what gets base generated in there. And it's also strange in that it's a really um, hotbed for movement. We've actually seen at least two different types of movement um, out, to, out of or into um, T. We've seen T to C movement in the case of um, questions plus Q C heads that draw T up to C. Should I go to the store where should started low in the T and got raised higher than that subject? Should I instead of I should? We've also seen affix lowering like I crawled where the ED is lowering from T onto V. Uh, for crawled. So we've seen a lot of movement there, which is really weird. But what I'm going to talk to you more about is what you should base generate in T. And I'm going to start this by saying you should in every, 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 every single one of your trees generate something in T. And here we have a dilemma. There's a difference that we haven't, I haven't said explicitly to you yet in this class that I want to say explicitly to you now. I'm drawing a tree while I say this. If it feels like I'm stalling, that's because I am. While I draw, of course. There's a difference that I haven't said explicitly where we've been putting stuff in C. What goes in C? Uh, things like plus Q features, things like plus WH features, things like that. That is base generated in C. I know that you like ice cream. That That is also in C. So we've seen plenty of stuff that gets generated in C. But is Ross going to blow a fuse if you leave C empty? If you just don't write anything in C, if there doesn't need to be anything there? There's no that, there's no plus Q feature, there's no plus WH feature. No, I'm not. I don't care about that. Feel free to leave C empty. If you can, I mean, if it needs something there, then I'm gonna expect you to put it there, but it doesn't always. This is very different from T, the T head. I will blow a fuse if you lose T, if you leave T empty. There's always, always something generated in T. There's always something generated in T. What, so what are, what are our candidates? What are our candidates for things that are generated in T? Well, T stands for tense, so we're going to get tense things there. So plus past tense gets generated there. 
plus past tense, right? That example where we moved the ed down onto crawl and made crawl into crawl, that's fine. That's something being generated into t. The one that's easy to forget is that plus present tense is also generated in there and undergoes the same things. So if this sentence was, um, I crawl, I'll add the dp here. I'll erase my tense like a bad kid for now. It's not a bad kid, it's just, you know, incorrect. Doesn't mean you're a bad person. I don't mean to imply that, even jokingly. Um, so if I had the sentence, I crawl, and that's it, and this is like a totally complete and awesome sentence, we don't need anything in C, and it doesn't appear as though we need anything in T because this sentence is fine, Ugh, you're wrong, you need something here. You need a plus present tense. <coughs> This sentence denotes present tense, I crawl. And so what we need is a present tense that drops down on there. Does it add an ed? Does it add any external morphemes, overt morphemes? No, it doesn't. But it's still there. It's still there, class. It's still there. So you still need to add that in there. If you're missing, if you can't figure out what goes in T, there's a good chance it's present tense. So check for that. Other things that get generated in T, because this is a long list and we're not done yet. Modal verbs. Modal verbs. Cross, what's a modal verb? Well, they're this weird ragtag group of things that are best illustrated by example. So they're things like should and could and might and would. Ought. Right? I'm not going to write that one. These modal verbs, they get base generated directly into T. These are, these are modal verbs. They have a verbal element. They don't get a VP. They don't. They don't. They don't. They get, they get straight slapped into T, base generated into T. How do you know that? Well, go watch a previous lecture, but the uh, TLDR of the story is that they're in complementary distribution with tense. And that gives us a good idea that they should be base generated in T. So you have some options for what you generate in T. I'm going to write them down in a list as well. Tense is an option. Modals or modal verbs, either way. Tense is an option. Modals are an option. What's our last thing that we can generate straight into T? Well, it's this weird infinitive two. Um, it's a two. So we've been looking at a lot of non-finite clauses with these raising and control sentences, like I want to crawl, I want to crawl. And when we get those non-finite clauses, that two goes in T. That two goes on in, into T there, to crawl. It's a, it's a non-finite one, and that means that this position isn't going to get tense. Uh, uh, ah, ah, misspoke. This position is not going to get um, case, which is weird. But that's where that goes. A disclaimer here is to differentiate this two. Two is unfortunately mul multiplicitous in its homophony in English, right? Two can mean like T-W-O. Mm -hmm. T-W-O, that's something else, obviously. Nobody's messed that up and nobody will. Um, but the other aspects, two can also mean T-O-O. T-O-O, I went to, I went also. Don't worry about that one. But even between the things that are just spelled T-O, there's also a duplicitousness, duplicitousness here, in which two can be the um, in the tense position here in the T head for something like to crawl, but it can also be a preposition. To bed. So you really want to be careful between your to bed to and your to crawl to because they get base generated in different positions. This one is not a preposition. It's, a, it's in the T head. This one is a preposition. How can you tell the difference? Well, there's actually a fairly straightforward way of telling the difference. It's what it takes as its complement. This one is always going to take a verbal element as its complement. Maybe not always. I think always. We're going to say always, even though I'm not certain of that. It always takes a verbal complement to crawl, to run, uh, to hide, to whatever. 
where these prepositional ones almost always at least take a DP as their complement to bed. I went to bed, to the store, um, to the hill, just like prepositions normally do. So differentiate your twos. Differentiate your twos. This two is not this two. Don't confuse them. Don't try and call this one a preposition. Don't try and call this one a tense. A T. Okay, those are my two big ones. I'm going to go rapid fire, hopefully, through uh, the, my last two here. Uh, we're going to talk about theta grids just super briefly. We've been doing more theta grids, and they've become more important now that we've talked about these raising and control structures. For the most part, you guys have been doing a really good job with your theta grids. There's just um, there's two tips I have for you. One of them is a nice tip. The other one is a mean tip. You want the nicer one or the mean one first? I'll give you the nice one first. Your nice tip with theta rolls is to not forget to write what type of constituent it takes. So not only does the verb um, eat take an agent, Not only does it take an agent, it takes a specific type of agent. It takes a DP agent, right? It takes a DP agent, like the country or um, the shoplifter or whatever. Whoa, weird, weird choices. Um, it takes a DP. So don't forget, don't just write agent there, also write DP. And when you're writing, you know, it also takes something to get eaten. That's a theme. Uh, it's also a DP. What goes in these boxes? Why do I always make these boxes and 99% of the time I never fill them out? Um, it's the index, right? So if I said, I ate shoes, I would index these things with an I and a J probably, an I and a J, so that you could see in my example sentence that I is indexed with an I, coincidentally. So you know that this big I, me, I am the agent, and you know that shoes, indexed with J, is the theme. That's your uh, nice tip for it. Um, that's your nice tip for theta grids. Your mean tip for the theta grids is that only arguments get theta rolls. Only arguments get theta rolls. Only arguments get theta rolls. So, if I had the sentence, I ate shoes yesterday, I ate shoes yesterday. Do I need to change my theta grid to assign a theta roll to yesterday? Nope, because it's not an argument. It's not an argument. What can be arguments? What can be arguments? Well, really, there's there's multiple tips I have for you here. And these, these are kind of... Um, this is a mean tip because this is a hard thing to master. Um, your arguments are your complements. Your complements, remember the difference between complements and adjuncts, and your subjects. A subject can also be an argument, and especially for a verbal structure. So arguments is this term which encompasses subjects and complements. Subjects and complements, and it excludes adjuncts. So if you have an adjunct, like yesterday, that's A, totally unnecessary, in this the sentence makes total sense, and B can't be moved closer, really, uh, can't be moved on the other side of complement. I ate yesterday's shoes, it's weird. Um, don't give this a theta rule. Don't give that a theta rule. Um, adjuncts don't get theta rules. Adverbs don't get theta rules, right? All of these different things, they don't get theta rules. Um, the only possible things that can get theta rules there are um, DPs, Prepositional phrase, PPs, and CPs, complementizer phrases. You'll never give an adverb phrase or an adjective phrase uh, a theta rule because they're always adjuncts. They're always adjuncts. They're always unnecessary, superfluous. So that's your theta grid uh, rundown. Again, very quickly, these are things you can feel free to ask questions about on Thursday if you want me to go into more depth. And then lastly, I'm going to say this okay as fast as I can anyway my last tip concerns constituency tests um, doing constituency tests my number I have two tips they're both 
Okay, one is I kind of have a nice tip and a mean tip for constituency tests too. I didn't do that on purpose. Um, my nice tip about constituency tests is to remember that they exist. Mm -hmm. that, that they're going to be on your exam, I promise you. I'm already making the exam. They're on there. Constituency tests are on your exam, so you're going to have to remember how to do them. My mean tip for constituency tests is that they're kind of hard again. Um, I have one... Basically, I just want you to remember that they exist. You guys are pretty good at doing constituency tests, so I'm not terribly worried. The one thing that I see um, coming up with, coming up when people are running constituency tests, okay, I see two things when people are running constituency tests. One is concerning movement. So let's do a, a quick example. We're gonna do, why did I start writing in the middle of the board? That's never a good idea. Here's my sentence. I have a couple minutes. We'll slow down a second here. The man with the umbrella. <laughs> with the umbrella. Ran. And I want you to know, I want to ask you if with the umbrella is a constituent. We've done a possibly even one uh, this exact sentence. If not, we did one very similarly. So you want to be testing for with the umbrella. Here's the two things that I see people mess up most often. One is when trying to um, perform a movement test, people will move this into random places, um, which is, it's actually pretty fair to the spirit of the test. The spirit of this test is that you can move this chunk without con together as a unit. That's how you can tell it's a constituent. But in this class, I'm being much more picky and you can't just move it anywhere. You have to move it to the front of the sentence, the front of the sentence. So you can't say, the man ran with the umbrella. Okay, that's, that's, that is actually somewhat convincing to me that it's a constituent, but it's not how I want you to do the test. I want you to say it was with the umbrella the man ran. It was with the umbrella the man ran. Right? I want you to move it to the front always. Don't just move them randomly. Um, don't move them to the end. Don't move the other things. Um, so don't say it was with the umbrella ran the man. Right? Only move the underlined part. Only move the underlined part and only ever move it to the front of the sentence. Last um, constituency tip is with the coordination test. Um, the coordination test I find to be truly the hardest of all the tests. So my, my pro tip is um, don't use that test if you can avoid it. But if you want to use that test, that's totally fine. It's a very good test. I just think it's hard to diff difficult to use. And what I see here is that people will try and coordinate with pieces of the underlined thing, but not with the entirety of the underlined thing. So if you, for instance, I'll write this one down so it's easier to grasp. The man... If you tried to do this as your test, the man with the umbrella and the diamond ran. The man with the umbrella and the diamond ran. This looks like a good coordination test because you're, you're trying to coordinate with the umbrella, with the diamond. But what you don't see here is that that's not actually, what it's hard to, what it's easy to miss here is that that's not actually what you're coordinating in this circumstance. In this circumstance, what you've coordinated is the umbrella and the diamond. And you've left this with out. But we wanted to test for the with. We didn't want to just test for the umbrella. We wanted to test with with the umbrella. So you're going to need some kind of preposition in there as well. So if you change this simply to something like the man with the umbrella and with the diamond ran, now we're in business because now we can more see, clearly see that we're coordinating with the, with the umbrella and with the diamond. Whiteboard down. Whiteboard down for a long time. Hopefully for a very long time if um, the pandemic goes the way I hope it does. At the end of my content for today, I have a last couple things that I want to say in my remaining 40 seconds. First and most important thing that I want to say in my remaining now 30 seconds is thank you. Um, 
you guys have been fantastic for this whole class. I'll say again in person, but I don't mind it being recorded here for YouTube. It's been a fantastic semester. You guys have put up with a lot, um, particularly in the face of all the changes that have been happening um, in your lives in general. I don't imagine, I don't have this uh, weird false sense that the only changes that have happened to you in the past two months have been academic ones. Um, it's a weird time out there. It's extremely weird. And you guys have been extremely resilient in rolling with the punches in a, a spot that's already a, an odd time in your life, which is your undergraduate career. There's already a lot of changes, already a lot of things going on. And the coronavirus pandemic has just made a weird time weirder. Um, so I really appreciate you guys sticking out this course. If you've made it this far, you've made it to the last of my video lectures. If you're reading this message, no. Um, and that's awesome. So I appreciate you guys putting up with me and my janky whiteboard as we try to make the best of an, what is just uh, undeniably an unfortunate situation in, in, our, in our world. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks. That's, that's, that's most of what I wanted to say. Thanks for sticking it out. You guys have been fantastic. You've made this class a joy. Um, even in hard times here online, the Friday synchronous classes have been really nice just to get some feedback with you guys. So um, I'll talk to you Thursday, but um, thanks again. And uh, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it's been all right. Feel free to email me at any point, either before Thursday or after, of course, if you have any questions or any concerns or um, you're bored and you want to say, hey, those are all perfectly good re uh, reasons to email me. So um, I'll see you guys Thursday. Hopefully I'll be seeing you after that as well next semester or if you're graduating. Fantastic luck to you. Um, and I hope to see you in the future and I'm excited to see where you end up in the world. Have a fantastic um, time until I until we meet again. Thanks.